Uh, so it's really an honor to be here. I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to share uh, our work. I'm going to be speaking in plural because even though it's just me, I'm part of a team who's doing this. Um, and uh, as I told Gina and Phil and Mark and Rasmus when we talked about this visit, my idea is to workshop a presentation rather than to present a polished, finished product. I'm going to present a research in progress that uh, is still a little bit under uh, data collection phase, what you're about to see. And then I'm going on sabbatical in September. The idea is to write a book out of uh, this uh, next academic year, so your input will be most appreciated. Uh, feel free to ask any kinds of questions, in particular those that are highly critical, to point at any flaws of the many that we have in this project. Uh, still, uh, it will be really most appreciated. Okay, enough prefatory remarks. I think you're going to be better off looking at this instead of this. Um, so, uh, in a study that was released in February of this year, the Pew Center in the U.S. Uh, ask people, among other things, in terms of how you get to the news online. Um, you get to the news by going to a website, you get to the news by going through social media or through search. And basically, going directly to a website is in equal footing with going through the social media channels for the general population. However, if you look at the younger segment of the population, 18 to 29, there is a huge difference. About half of them primarily go to uh, access news through social media platforms. And in terms of those who are my uh, age group, 50 and older, only a quarter, slightly less than a quarter, access the information that way. This is highly consistent with the data that the Reuters Institute here has been producing for a number of years now. Um, if you look at ways of accessing the news for over the past four years, the only channel that is trending upwards is social media, okay, here in the green light. And if you look at social media as the main source of news, by the way, this data is just for the US, right? If you look at the comparative work that they do, and if you look at social media as the main source of news, comparing 2015 with 2016, you see it growing in almost all of the countries that they have surveyed, with the exception of Finland, where it has remained low and relatively flat. And again, consistent with the data from Pew in the US as an average of the 26 countries that uh, Reuters sur surveyed for the 2016 report, the most recent I have available. I believe 17 is coming up quite soon. For the very young segment of population, those who are 18 to 24, social media has become, for the first time, the main channel for accessing news of information, surpassing television here. So this is 30,000 feet above the ground. This is how you can look at it by asking lots of people in many different countries. This is a little bit of how it plays out, you know, in the, you know at one feet or maybe five feet or six feet above the ground. Uh, this is a college student, uh, Sarah, who's 21 years old at the time we talked to her, in the uh, city of Rosario, which uh, is a city about, you know, 150 miles away or so. Uh, from Buenos Aires, most famous perhaps for being the birthplace of, uh, you know, football, I would say here, rather than soccer, of football's greatest, Lionel Messi, this is a week ago when he scored the decisive goal against Real Madrid at the <laughs> Stadio Calderon, 3-2 in stoppage time. Sorry, I have to have, as an Argentine, I have to have a reference to Messi, in particular this iconic picture. Look at the T-shirt, the jersey is floating in the air. Let's go back to research. So uh, Sarah was uh, on a Friday night, I believe, uh, going out with her girlfriends to a bar, and she wanted to see what other group of girlfriends were doing in another bar. In order to do that, she grabbed her phone and went on Facebook. While she was doing that, she stumbled upon a piece of news from her hometown newspaper. Right? And then that interested her, so she looked at it. Okay. So again, you have a person 
who on a Friday night goes out to have fun with her friends to a bar, wants to check out the broader social network scene. By broader social network, I mean her social network scene. The only way to do that is through or on or in or within the media. Right? She goes on Facebook and a piece of news appears. So she consumes that information. Did she intend to go out on a Friday night with her friends to get the news? Not really, primarily, no. Did she go on Facebook primarily to get the news? No. Nonetheless, she stumbled upon that piece of news and incidentally, she found it. Right? And that interested her, so she you know, spent maybe five seconds, maybe seven seconds. I don't know how many seconds. If we go through the trace data, probably no more than three or four. And this way of consuming news and information, right, which we characterize as something that is incidental, has been right, something that is not the main activity that they are doing, something that's a little bit of a side dish, and you do as a byproduct of doing that activity. Has been something, a form of consuming news and information that has been around for a very long time. Anthony Downs wrote about it in 1957 in The Economic Theory of Democracy. And in recent years, there has been a little bit of a revival of work in that area, in particular the work of Homero Hilde Zuniga at the University of Vienna has been particularly influential. What we claim in our work is that even though we've always had incidental forms of news consumption, you're walking down the street to go from point A to point B, and there is a store that is selling TV, so there is a you know, CNN show there, or Sky News, or you know, whichever uh, they are showing there, and you're walking, and you watch, and you stop for two seconds, and then you continue watching. You are not on the streets to get the news. You're on the streets to go from point A to point B. Incidentally, you stumble upon a piece of content, so you consume it. The same, you are in the supermarket waiting to pay. You know, you overhear the cashier talking about the wonderful Lionel Messi performance two days ago with a customer ahead of you. So you learn about football. You didn't intend to learn about that, but nonetheless, you learn. However, our main claim here is that which was exceptional which was peripheral, which was secondary to the main ways of consuming news, where consuming news was a primary deliberate activity. You sit down to read the paper, you sit down to watch TV, or you are commuting in your car and listening to radio news. Now has become the norm, has become center and core to how people, in particular young people, learn about current events. We argue that this is perhaps the most important transformation in the consumption of news and information digitally since the advent of the commercial web in the mid-1990s. And most importantly, we argue that it is a very, very generative window to look at broader transformations at the intersection of media, technology, and society that go beyond the news, but that characterize the kind of digital culture that all of you at OII are so experts and studying and have made very important contributions. Because it is a relatively new phenomenon, it's also a relatively understudied phenomenon. Even in a short book that two University of Missouri uh, professors published, I believe it was in January of this year, they write, you know, this topic has received very limited systematic research attention. And if in general it has been understudied, when it comes to the younger segment of the population, it has been even less studied. Now, when I say social network news, which is a way of amalgamating network news as a gesture to the media system of the second half of the 20th century with social networks as a gesture to you know, what might be new about the world of, new and of news and information in the 21st century. I am not talking about social network analysis. I use social networks as a synonym for social media with apologies to the network analysts in the room. This is just a book titled courtesy of John Carson a uh, friend of mine, a historian at the University of Michigan, who suggested this title, and we sort of like it very much. So in this project, we are trying to answer three kinds of questions. The first question is, what is it that people are doing when they consume the news incidentally, and how that happens? That is, what's the experience of getting your news incidentally? What are the practices? What are the interpretations? And what is the affect associated with this mode of getting news and information? We want to know 
after that, why, what are the factors that explain right, the rise of this historically and also that explain variance across age groups, across uh, groups in terms of socioeconomic status and any other factors that might be relevant and also understand which factors are not. <coughs> and finally, what are the main implications for this for media, right, for culture and for politics? Today I'm going to be mostly focusing on the first question. I will share some speculations about the second and I will welcome any kind of pointer, pointers and critiques everywhere, but in particular here. Right? We are only beginning to try to figure out the explanatory story and I will hint at some of the main implications that we've been thinking about so far. Uh, by the way, I know you take questions at the end. I'm happy to answer questions at any time, clarification questions or otherwise. So in order to uh, try to come to terms with the phenomenon, we adopt what a former student of mine, Ignacio Siles, and I call a text on material perspective. That is, we understand that this is as much technological as it is journalistic. That is, as much about the technological infrastructure, hardware and software, and technical practices as it is about forms of reading, forms of interpretation, and forms of appropriation. When I say, or when we claim, that it is a significant historical discontinuity, we do it in part, and I will come back to this at the end, thinking about what we know from the literature were the dominant forms of consuming news and information during the 20th century in what we call legacy or traditional media, print, radio, and television. Right? What is that the research has indicated, decades of decades of research are the main sort of parameters of consuming news there and that, that, how that compares with the consumption of news and information incidentally in digital media. So there are three main findings that I think is important to uh, put on the table. Number one, the research about reading newspapers, watching television, listening to the radio from Leo Bogart onwards during a whole lot of the 20th century showed time and again that it was a highly routinized fashion, highly routinized uh, form of information appropriation. For instance, my father used to read the newspaper every morning at the same time at the same table, usually sitting in the same place. Right? There was the lead, they're watching to the uh, television newscast in the evening, everybody sitting, you know, in front of the television, usually also in the same places, in the, in the sofa, in the living room. Related to that, not only was usually was a sort of tight choreography of news consumption in everyday life, but it was highly related to fairly predictable temporal and spatial coordinates. Right? It was the newspaper, for instance, in the morning, the breakfast table, the radio program going to work or back from work, and the television uh, newscast in the evening. Of course, there are variations, but that's sort of the dominant. And uh, the third element that is important to understand and to put the findings from today in historical perspective is that time and again the research showed that the consumption of news was part and parcel of the practices of everyday life. It was highly integrated with patterns of sociability, which continues to this day, but this day the same patterns of sociability are not really the same as they were before. If I want to find out now what my friends are doing, I go on Snapchat or Facebook or Instagram, etc. We didn't have that 30 years ago. We had to wait until going back home, you know, and the next day calling on the phone and things of that nature. In terms of what we know from about now 20 or 18 or so years of uh, research about the consumption of news in digital media, a couple of things that are relevant to today's discussion. Number one, at the beginning of uh, the consumption of news on the commercial web, in the second half of the 90s, beginning of the uh, early 2000s, there was a lot of discussion about whether the new entrant was going to displace, in terms of news consumption, the legacy media, or it was going to be piled on top of that. That is, people were going to consume online news on top of their regular consumption of legacy media or not. Um, one of the key factors then was that there was much more displacement the younger you went in terms of the age group. So age has shown to be an important uh, factor in settling this debate. At the time, it wasn't, you know, 15, 10 to 15 years ago, it wasn't so clear. Since then, 
the research has shown much more conclusively that there is a process of you know, significant displacement, that the more time you spend on one, the less time you spend on the other. So in that sense, youth was a little bit of an avant-garde, which is a topic that will come again in the presentation later. The second uh, significant finding that is emerging from the literature is that there seems to be a strong correlation between access and use of mobile devices, in particular smartphone devices like my iPhone, and the consumption of news on social media. The third one is this idea, first introduced by Alfred Hermida at the University of British Columbia, that because of the proliferation of social media channels, in particular Twitter, Journalism now is moving into what he calls an ambient mode, in which news are everywhere. They're not just encapsulated in a particular device, on a particular platform, but they're everywhere surrounding people. The way Al proposed this was on the, you know, as an observation that characterizes the supply side, he called for research on how people appropriate this availability of information. We are building on that to propose uh, you know, some explanation, some account of how this is happening now. So in terms of the research design, this is uh, part of a larger project. Uh, we use mixed methods, primarily fieldwork and surveys, uh, to understand the consumption of news in social media. Um, I'm going to be presenting from the work we've been doing in Argentina starting in March of last year. As I will show you in a minute, it's part of a larger comparative project. Um, we started in Argentina with interviews about 14 months ago. We do between five and seven a month. We have 94 actually as of yesterday, not 93. Uh, 43 of them with people who are 18 through 29. The rest with people who are older. I'm going to be focusing on the young people, but I will share uh, some findings from older segments of the population, and I've seen enough of the material from the older segments of the population to know that consistent with the research that I presented at the beginning from Pew and from Reuters, there are significant differences between young consumers and older consumers. In addition to that, we do an annual survey uh, of, in last year we did 700 people in the greater Buenos Aires area, which is about 40% of the population of the country, old fashioned, pen and paper, you know, knocking on the door, can we please talk to you? The reason why we didn't do online or telephone is that in a country with 31 to 32% of the population living below the level of poverty, uh, technological limitations are quite significant. So we went the old fashioned route. This allowed us to get to about 92% of, 92-93% of socioeconomic strata. Uh, strata. The, those who are at the very, very bottom, uh, normally they are very difficult to be surveyed. And uh, survey research firms, sometimes they don't want to venture into those locations. But we have much more representativeness than had we gone with an online survey or a telephone survey for this population. Um, as I said before, this is part of a larger comparative study uh, that includes Argentina and four other countries, five continents in total. We started in the U.S. with interviews in the Greater Chicago area, Greater Miami area in January of this year. We will launch uh, the Northeast with a person in Philadelphia in a month and a half to two months. We have done about 40 plus interviews at this point. I'm happy to share preliminary results and some comparisons with Argentina in the Q&A if you want. Uh, we start fieldwork in Italy, in Bologna. I learned uh, earlier today, uh, tomorrow. And um, we start in Israel uh, probably in August. And in Japan, uh, we have a grant that starts in October. We we'll probably start data collection later in the year or if not January, depending on how fast we can move assembling the team and doing all that. Again, the, the day that I'm going to be presenting today focuses on the younger segment population in Argentina. I don't take them as representative of all you know, uh, demographic groups in terms of age, but I do take them, I take the liberty of considering them a little bit as functional sources of innovation, as my former uh, colleague Eric von Hippel used to say, or leducers thinking that the practices that they are pioneering or where they, uh, you know, that are expressed more intensely in this age group, eventually will trickle down and we move to other 
um, age groups. Okay, enough prefatory remarks. Um, the interviews that we do are open-ended, um, with the exception of a few things that we try to ask everybody. And one of them, that usually happens halfway through the interview process, has to do with their screens. You know, when we ask people about, you know, information and media, etc., people start talking, oh, I, my computer or my television or my phone. So halfway through the conversation, people have named several devices. So um, we ask them routinely, you know, could you please rank order all of these personal screens, right, in terms of the most valuable to you to the least valuable to you? And invariably, for this age group, the most valuable to them is the smartphone. In a very distant second place, the computer, and way, way, way in the background, the television. The cell phone, without a doubt, then television. But when I watch TV, I'm also on my phone, right? And if I'm not watching TV, I'm still on my phone. What I use the most is the cell phone, then the TV, and then the computer. The TV, because I can also navigate the internet on it. So I use it as a computer. Footnote, for my second book for News at Work, I did research in this same context, you know, all age groups, in the years 2007 and 2008, I did 66 interviews with news consumers. Um, back then, it was all about the computer. And the discussion was laptop versus de desktop in this population. In less than 10 years, the computer has been greatly displaced by the smartphone as the artifact of choice. Why? Three reasons that repeatedly come up in interviews, you know, Time and again and again and again. Number one, that you can do many things with the computer, almost all of them. I use the cell phone in multiple ways. Calls, messages, WhatsApp, Facebook, sometimes Netflix, music, even listen to the radio on it too. I have it with me all the time. It's like another hand, maybe part of my body. Another footnote, the prevalence of bodily metaphors, usually referring to upper extremities, is quite significant, right? The association of this with part of this comes, comes again and again. Second, it's not only you can do many things, but it's with you all the time, right? You can take it with you, unlike the computer, I like the TV set. I, I always have the telephone, the cell phone, sorry, at hand. It's more convenient than opening up the computer and turning the television on. Since I'm out and about all day, what I access the most is the phone. So third issue is that ubiquity, right? Not only with you all the time, but it allows you to be connected everywhere with anybody. And therefore, you never or very rarely are unconnected. Everybody has their little small exceptions. For this person, it's religion. Right. When they go to church, that's the only time they part ways mm -hmm. with the telephone. The telephone might be with them, but it's on airplane mode, like when I'm speaking with you right now. Right, and I put it on airplane mode. When you go to the movies, sometimes it's on airplane mode, not, every, not all the time. And we all have our little excuse, the babysitter, or the this, or the that, etc. So I want to check, right? So why is the computer a distant second? Again, the main theme in our interviews is that the computer has moved to what we become, what we call an instrumental object. Something that you use discreetly for particular purposes, in this case, work, and study, or sometimes one or the other, depending on the age and the occupation of what the person is doing. And because these are two activities that if they had their choice, they might not be doing, there is an emotional association that is somewhat negative with the computer that you don't have with the cell phone. Okay? So the computer is mainly for school and maybe for music, very rarely for Facebook or Twitter. And the cell phone, no, the cell phone most of the time. Okay? What happens with the television? Television is always there. Again, another footnote. In a country like Argentina, most people who are college students would live with their parents unless they live in very small towns in the interior of the country. So it's common that people will stay living with their parents until 25, 26, 27, when they have you know, gotten enough money to rent a place. So most of our interviewees live with their parents, likely that there are television sets in their house, likely that they are on, but for them, they are part of a sonic background. 
which is why, interestingly enough, in surveys, people will answer that they learn a lot about current events from television because television is in the sonic background. So they may learn a lot from it. But in terms of their actual practices, at least for this age group, um, very, very minimal. Notice this, which is interesting. Even if a soccer game is on, and I should say football, this is mostly for American audiences, I, I apologize uh, for that. Uh, and as, as you know, uh, football in Argentina is a religion, it's probably the religion. Um, so even if a soccer game is on, the most important thing is to listen to the newscast. And I can do both things referring to being on the phone. So most of our interviewees would follow you know, the, the sonic part of the game on TV, and then they would actually watch the game on Twitter or Facebook or both on their phones. Mm -hmm. OK, so it's really in the background. And print, which is not a screen, but it's interesting to include for comparison, is really a museum mm -hmm. artifact in the day experience, in the life you know, with the everyday life experience of most of our interviewees. In households where there is a print subscription, they do not touch it. They do not dare to touch it, with the exception of Sundays, probably between 11 in the morning and 2 or 3 p.m. as part of a family ritual of a late breakfast or uh, an early lunch, more like a late breakfast in, in that culture uh, where they would get together and you know they would split sections and maybe peruse through it. It's just from the vantage point of the actor, the interface design is much more cumbersome than this interface design. This is much more convenient. I'm not giving an engineering evaluation here. This is what our subjects say. This is much more convenient than you know a broadsheet or any other print format. In addition to that, we, we sort of anticipated. What we didn't anticipate is the intensity of the ecological concerns of this generation. It's, it comes up with certain frequency that people associate newsprint with environmental damage, and they do not want to be associated with that. Even if they are not buying the newspaper, the newspaper is there, they don't want to touch it because that would partake with a particular destruction of the environment that they are not fond of. So this is central for many things, but in particular for the role it plays in accessing social media. Right? Taking a cue for, from Mark Doyce's uh, work on media life, what we see here is that what arises from this constant use of the phone is a social media life. People are not using Facebook or Twitter, they are living in Facebook and Twitter for the most part. Our age group doesn't go on Snapchat very often, and uh, they go on Instagram to a certain extent, not as much as uh, what we expected. I will show you also survey data on that. But one of the main contentions that we have, if not the main contention, is that the rise in the prominence of incidental news consumption signals or is a window or an opportunity to observe a transition in the media environment and the media from being discrete objects that we use to perform certain tasks or to do certain things to environments in which we live our lives that are not secondary, that are not tools to live in our life. We live primarily our lives within the media. If I'm doing nothing, I go on Twitter. I go on Facebook whenever I don't want to do anything else. Looking at Twitter is when I do the most when I'm in the bus. WhatsApp is nowadays like a tool. It's another hand again. No? Everybody uses it and it's super indispensable. I'm in the bus, I have 15 minutes, I'm on social media. I'm walking down the street and I'm on social media. I'm driving my car, right? I have 35 seconds at the stoplight and I check Facebook. Okay, so we can see nothing, so we can relate to this. We ask this person to estimate, we ask many people to estimate you know, the amount of time they think they are on social media, and this person said 10 minutes per hour. Okay, what was interesting from an ethnographic standpoint is that he felt he had to clarify that that not included the time he was spending <laughs> sleeping. Okay? Um, I know journalists that I've interviewed for my work that, that sleep with CNN on. So I can preview a a moment in which we will always have somewhat a Facebook feed or whichever social media platform we like rolling all the time. The intensity of the use of social media platforms is so high that we get a lot of 
voluntarily comments on, I am not an addict. You know, I can, I can put it away at any time that I want, you know. And then usually follows, for two months I logged off of Facebook. I, I deleted the app from my phone. I found out that I was missing out so much. On, in real life, I, was missing, I had to go back to it. Right? So to moderate that, people have moments. I have you know, social media free zones or times. Everybody has different one. This person has one that has to do with the romantic life. So you know, with my girlfriend, we have the tacit rule of not using the cell phone so that we can talk about our days you know, at the end of work when they get together in the apartment in the evening. But when she starts doing something else, and that means going to the kitchen, right? Or, you know, that we're talking about the two minute or a minute and a half task, I take advantage to catch up with my cell phone. Not through the cell phone, but with my cell phone, which means going on social media, which is why when we ask people, and these are, you know, a subset of the 700 that we poll, these are the people who go on social media, um, when we ask people to estimate their own frequency of social media use, what we get is that for the age group that we are uh, talking about, more than 90% of them say that they are, they are all the time or almost constantly or multiple times a day. And, and as you can see, as people age, their frequency decreases. Where do they access? What is their favorite device to access social media? consistent with the interview data is the phone. Remember the tablet? Remember when the tablet came out and Rupert Murdoch made the prediction that he was going to save journalism, right? He's, he made the same prediction when he invested $500 million on MySpace, right? Uh, but that's another story. So, and what is their favorite social network? There are two social networks that dominate, right? The game in this population, one is Facebook, that is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is technically a messaging service. After three months of interview, we designed this, the, um, the interviews, we designed the survey. And because in the interviews, people were telling us that to them, WhatsApp was a social media platform, we included it as an option here. Okay? Not that because we you know, technically think it qualifies as a social media platform, but the way people use it many times, it resembles that. So the interesting thing here is that, first, if you know your political economy 101, it's all Facebook all the time, because Facebook owns WhatsApp. Right? Um, on top of that, you know, Snapchat doesn't really register for people who are uh, 18 and older. Even though a company is valued at $26 billion now, uh, it really is valued on the bet that the 12 or 11th through 17-year-old market will carry forward into the future, and that you know, the younger you are, the more you likely you are going to be on Facebook. The older you are, the more likely you are going to be on WhatsApp. What emerges at the intersection of this constant use of the cell phone and living your social media life is incidental news. Okay. Consistent with the Pew data and the Reuters data, when we ask people to estimate you know, uh, from you know, 1 to 5 in a Likert scale, uh, how much agree or they disagree with this question of, you know, new show up when I'm on social media. 75 plus percent of our sample who's 18 and 29 years old say that this, that they either agree or strongly agree with that. What this means is that they are consuming the news on social media when they are doing something else. New show up or come across when I'm in a moment on leisure and on Facebook, so I consume it there and then. Right? I learned about an earthquake in Italy on Nangak, right? and then two days later, it show up on TV. Why? Because it's more dynamic to access the news. I have everything there and then. Right? I have everything on a single place. What's going on in my social environment and in my real environment? Which one is more real than the other? We don't know, and exactly you know, how people live their lives, but it's clearly the case that through social media, they are joining the many different spheres of their social experience. I'm, I'm speeding up because I, Gina asked me to stop at six, and I have six minutes. So um, what this means is that the practice of reading, the practice of reception, and the ways of 
making sense of the information change. Okay? What people tell us again and again is that reading is very brief, is interrupted, and is partial. What do I mean by this? So I'm walking down the street. I'm reading Facebook. Oh, I arrive to my destination. Then I stop. Or I have to cross you know, the street, so I have to get up and you know, put this, you know, my eyesight elsewhere. When I can continue walking, I'm not going to go to the same news item, because most likely right, Facebook would have already shown me something else the same on Twitter. It is interrupted because it's not that we sit down you know, at the breakfast table, oh, let's read Facebook today. Let's read, you know, from you know, 7 to 7.30, I'm going to read Facebook. We just do it all the time. We also do it at the breakfast table sometimes, but we do it all the time. And it is very partial because very rarely, at least in you know, what people tell you, they, s they continue after the headline and the lead that they see on the social media feed. They might click on it and save it for later, right? But they don't have time to sit down and read something. And if they click and go on the site, they usually do not pass the first paragraph. If you look at the Comscore and Nielsen data, what it shows is that if you are consuming digital news on your computer, you are spending three times more time than you are if you are consuming the same site, news on the same site on your cell phone. And this is in part because of this, right? When you are on your cell phone, usually you are there through a social media platform. And even if you are not there through a social media platform, you are not spending as much time. Do you remember how much time you spent reading that new story? Well, it had 150 characters, which is wrong, it had 140. So it was quick, right? OK, so I have four minutes for conclusions and, and, and discussion. Uh, I might take a few more. Um, so, in terms of the experience of consuming the news incidentally, first, it's something that really emerges at the triad of the technological, inf the large scale technological infrastructure, the devices that we have, right, the smartphone as a device in particular, and the algorithms of the different platforms per se, which are more on the software side, plus the availability of information. If information was not available, we would not be learning about current events in this way. But it's not just about the availability of information. It also has to do with having access to the technology and knowing how to use it, plus the different affordances of the different platforms. It is part and parcel of living within the media. And in that sense, it's functional within that. And it is an ambient practice. It's not something that it is discrete, right? that I sit down to watch this television newscast. I am surrounded by information, and I access it this way. And it's not necessarily, however, about the availability of information or the hardware and the software. We have a parallel study on the consumption of entertainment, right? where the same entertainment content right, is available with the same platforms and using the same devices. And for the most part, people sit down to watch Game of Thrones. And they watch it with others, and they watch it at the previously scheduled time for the most part. If they binge watch, that has its, its own parallel routine. But it's not, there is no technological determinism here. It's not just about having the information or the technological apparatus. It's in part something having to do with this particular content versus entertainment content. What we see here is that it is the product and it reproduces a kind of intentionality that is different from the purely accidental, but also from the purely deliberate. It is not purely accidental. Most of our users are fairly, or interviewers are fairly, the viewers, sorry, are fairly savvy social media consumers. So they have a sense that they might encounter a piece of news. Or even if they don't have much sense or they don't go on social media to encounter a piece of news, it's not that, oh, wow, there is a story on my Facebook feed. No, they sort of know that they will encounter that. And some of them use it as a gathering point of information. But it's not the main goal for going on social media. And it's not that every time that they go on social media, they go to learn about current events. So for now, we, we are struggling to find the best qualifier. A uh, friend of ours and colleague, Lucas Graves, uh, you know, suggested Diffuse, 
a sort of a meeting point. I used to call it hybrid before, but I hate hybrid because hybrid is like a big box where you put all the things that don't fit. Um, so if you have suggestions, please feel free uh, to jump in. Um, we do think it also signals a shift in modes of knowing that uh, go from focusing a lot in depth on a fewer number of pieces to much more breadth at the expense of death, but with a gain of many more items of information. Okay? Um, it's also part, you know, to say this is part of our effort to being um, not nostalgic, let me just say. There's a lot of commentary about news on social media, in particular in the wake of last year's electoral dynamics, you know, the, the triple header of Brexit, the referendum in Colombia, and the Trump election. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, bad press uh, about, you know, social media news. And we think that there is not much to be gained epistemologically from adopting a nostalgic view that says, oh, everything was before then. Uh, was, I'm sorry, was better then. Um, and we think there are some benefits uh, of having a broader mode of information acquisition, even at the expense of breath. Different people react to uh, or express different kinds of affect and emotion when it comes uh, to talking about their experience of consuming news incidentally on social media. But the dominant one, the dominant kind of affect is fairly nonchalant. And um, one way in which this manifests itself in the interview process is, has to do with issues of recall. So what was the last time you learned about, you know, current events? Uh, oh, it was, you know, 15 minutes ago. I was waiting for you for this interview. Oh, so what do you do? I was on Facebook and, you know, I saw a piece of news. What was the story about? Oh, I don't remember. Um, right, and then it's not only an issue of recall, it's that the affect is, well, I don't remember, I don't care, it was something that was fairly mundane, that it certainly doesn't bode well for the future of the industry. Um, finally, the other thing in terms of, you know, the experience of this is that what this does is recontextualizes the news report. So the news report in print or in television or in radio, any news article, any news segment is contextualized within the others, right? And it's part of a broader editorial decision-making process that basically tells the population, well, you know, of everything that happened in the previous day or week or month, these are the most important events and there is a balance and so on and so forth. All that is lost because the news report that you are accessing incidentally on Facebook is intermixed with stories about Messi, if you are a friend of mine, uh, on Facebook, or uh, food, or kittens, or travel, or whatever. And the other thing is that it loses tremendous hierarchy. Because a page one story in the New York Times, and above the fold, you know, story, you know, it's an important story. There are lots of people who spend a lot of time every day deciding in the editorial meetings, what, how are we going to lead? How are we going to open? So all that is gone, right? It's, it, uh, it really, and as a matter of fact, it's far more important, not whether that story is coming even from the New York Times, it's far more important who among my friends is posting that or tweeting about that than the origin. So in terms of um, the issue of continuity and discontinuity, there is a certain sense of continuity with most of news consumption during the 20th century that had to do with the role of everyday relational and social patterns that are central here. It's just that the character of those have changed significantly in part through the pervasive use of social media and mobile devices. In terms of the routine aspect, there are many routines. There is not just one single or two single routines. It's anywhere and everywhere, and the, diff the routines vary a lot by people, much more so than before. And also, there is no fixed temporal and spatial coordinate or set of coordinates. It really is everywhere, all the time. So um, let me speed this up. I I'm happy to go back to this. Two kinds of comments. Uh, just to close, and I'm happy to go back to issues of explanation and uh, a few other issues in the Q&A, but I want to leave uh, time. Um, one has to do with the role of the influence of the media, you know. Since Katz, 
and Lassersfeld in the, you know, I think it was 1955, when they wrote about two steps of influence, we have known that the media set the agenda in part through our interpersonal network, that there is a one, two step flow. With the rise of social media and the significant role of personal publics now, it's a three step flow, right? In part, it's not only your collocated social network, it's your social network not collocated, available sometimes only on social media, right? That, what it does is that it takes power away in the balance of power, because power is a zero sum game, right? it's a fixed pi. In the balance of power, by increasing the power of these personal publics mediated in social media, something has to give, and it's usually the power of traditional media platforms. And that's why, okay, social media platforms and the contacts there are having much more power than before in setting the agenda than traditional media platforms. In interviews time and again, people tell us that they believe in a story or they pay attention to the story much more because they know the contact who posted that story on Twitter or Facebook and they trust and believe that contact than because of the value of the source of origin. And what that means is that there is a significant process of brand decay and brand transfer. So the brand of the traditional media sources and the ability to monetize that brand through subscription and advertising goes down in relation to this. And what increases, right? So in terms of brand value, the brand value gets transferred from the media platform to the personal publics, right? And the contacts in the personal publics. But I don't monetize my Facebook recommendations, neither probably do any of you. So what is monetizing them is the platform. So it's a very interesting game, right, in which the value, right, the trust moves away from the traditional media organizations to the mediated social networks, but the monetization that the source loses doesn't stop at the social media contacts, it stays only within the social media platforms, which is why if you think about the market for display advertisement in the US, right, two thirds of every dollar spent, they are now a little bit more than two thirds, go to five players, none of which are traditional media sources, right? And if you look at mobile,